Have we read? And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, what's in your bag? All right, we'll see in just a moment. What's in your bag? I think I may change that and say, what's in my bag? Uh, now, what we have done, and I'll be brief, what we have done is we have uh, taken an in-depth uh, look at one of the great and marvelous apostles whose name is Peter. Peter, one of the great apostles of Jesus Christ, one of the great and influential figures in the Jerusalem church, having preached on that, on that uh, blessed day of Pentecost, which was the first gospel sermon preached in the world after the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the day of Pentecost, having been responsible, he and the 11 others, of preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. As a result, the great question was asked to the preacher, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter gave them an answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son, uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They that gladly receive his word were baptized, and there was added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Now, of course, we recognize that. We recognize that Peter was a great gospel preacher. We recognize that he was uh, a very dubious uh, man in terms of his personality, but he was a great apostle of Jesus Christ. So he writes to the strangers, to the strangers among the Jewish members of the Church of Christ. He writes to strangers. He writes to the proselytes. He writes to the strangers who had been baptized for remission of sin. Uh, in water, and they had received uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were called strangers. Now, why were they called strangers? These people, these members of the church were called strangers because they were basically all Gentiles. Gentiles, of course, at first did not have a right uh, to be a part uh, of the kingdom of God, but God sent his beloved son into the world that he might redeem the world unto himself. And when Jesus came and died on the old rugged cross, paid that price with his blood, all men then had a right to become children of God. But these people that Peter is writing to are called strangers. Not that they were not members of the Church of Christ. They were members of the Church of Christ but they were called strangers, and that was a colloquial way of referring to Gentile Christians as strangers. But Paul writes uh, to them, to the Ephesian church, to those who were in the Ephesian church, an Ephesian uh, Paul, the letter Paul says to the church at Ephesus, he said, um, there was a time when you was outside of Christ without hope in the world. But he said, having obeyed Christ, having received Christ, he said, but now are you no longer strangers, uh, but you are part, uh, are foreigners, but you are part of the body of Christ. So Peter writes to them, and what Peter is doing is, Peter is uh, in his old age, and I read you that last week, I showed you where it was last week, where Peter uh, had reached an ripe old age, and he was uh, almost ready to take leave from uh, these mundane shores to uh, take flight uh, to his kingdom, uh, to the kingdom of God, and uh, the eternal kingdom of God. And resultingly, 
Uh, he gives them certain information. He's, he gives them information. He gives the church information. And I'm giving you this information because it is my responsibility to be sure you get this information because you and I are going to be responsible for this information when we stand before the bar of God in the final roundup of human affairs. So it is important that we understand the dynamics of Peter's message to the church at Ephesus. Now in verse number five of 2 Peter chapter number one, Peter says to the church, he says, now, and besides all this, now I have told you what the this was, because when you take a look at your Bible, and I hope that you have underlined those things, um, uh, Peter writes to the church and he, he tells them all of the things that they have in Christ Jesus, all of the things that they have been blessed with now that they are children of God. And he says to them uh, in, in verse uh, number two uh, that they are recipients of the full knowledge of God. That is God's divine plan that he had for the world uh, before the world began. Uh, Peter says to the church there, uh, particularly the strangers, he says, you are recipients of the results of the full knowledge of God. Uh, we see that in verse number, uh, verse number two. Then verse number three of First Peter, uh, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. In other words, Peter says, you have been born again. Not only are you a recipient of the, uh, the, the glory of God, not only are, have you uh, been the recipients of God's mercy and God's grace, and God's salvation, not only are you recipients of all those good things, but he says, you have been begotten of God. When were they begotten? They were begotten on the day of Pentecost when they asked the question, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, now you are begotten of God. And verse number five, who are kept by the power of God through faith. These are uh, the superlatives that Peter uh, is saying to the church. Uh, that he is writing to. He is saying, uh, in other words, he's complimenting them. He is saying to them, you have been begotten of God. You are being kept uh, by the power of God. And he talks to them about the trials of their faith in verse uh, number seven. And in verse number nine, he talks about uh, their faith. And he mentions their faith. He mentions their faith in verse number five. He mentions their faith in verse number seven. He mentions their faith in verse number nine. And so uh, Peter writes to them and says, you have all of this, and this is what's important. You have all of this, you have all of this. Uh, you have uh, the power of God, you have all of that. You have been begotten of God, you have all of that. You have obeyed the faith, the one faith delivered to the saints. You have all of that. God uh, has taken you through the trials of your faith. You have all of that. Uh, and so it looks like the church here that Peter is writing to is in fairly decent shape. Uh, but Peter says in verse number five, now that's where we begin today, in verse number five of Second Peter chapter number one, uh, what I just said to you, they had all of these superlatives. He, uh, they had all of these great things. But then he says now in verse number five of uh, Second Peter, uh, if you put it on the jumbo screen so the folk can see it, uh, the Bible says, all right, uh, what's wrong with that side, okay? All right. And besides this, giving all diligence. And beside this, Beside this what? And beside all of this, 
And besides your strong faith, besides the fact that you've been begotten of God, besides of the fact that you have been uh, recipients of the full knowledge of God, be, uh, beside all of that, he says now, giving all diligence, he said, beside all of that, he said, don't miss this. He said, give this your best effort. Uh, he says now, uh, besides all of that, you've been baptized, you heard the gospel, you believed, you repented, you confessed, you were baptized for a mission of your sins, you remember the church of Christ, and you have participated uh, into the, in the mercy of God, you have been privy to the grace of God, you know God, your faith is intact, uh, you have been recipient of the power of God, but beside all of that, you need to do some other things. You need to do some other things. All of those of you in the room who are members of the body of Christ, you are members of the body of Christ. You're member of, of the church that was built and bought by Jesus Christ. You have all that good stuff. Your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. You have all that good stuff. And you know that if you live right and when you stand before God in the final roundup of human, uh, human affairs, if you have lived as God would have you lived, if you have walked circumspectively, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil, if you've done all of that, you make up in your mind and you give due diligence to the fact that there are some other things that you need. He said, giving all diligence, besides this, giving all diligence, do your dead level best. We are saying to every young person in the house, every middle-aged person in the house, every person in the house, the Bible says, giving all diligence. Peter had congratulated the church about their faith and the power of their faith and how their faith has been tried and how they have been, in so many words, conquerors. Uh, because of their faith, he said, but beside all of that, beside the fact that you've been baptized for the remission of your sin, beside that, beside you boast the fact, and it's okay to boast the fact that you're a child of God, beside the fact that you know you are a child of God, beside the fact that you know that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, beside the fact that you love him and that you worship him. Beside all of that, there are some things you need to add. And that's what I've been trying to teach you here for the last three weeks, and that is what's in your bag. When we say what's in your bag, we're talking about your faith. We're talking about your, your lifestyle. We're talking about how you live your life. We're talking about how you live from day to day. What's in your bag? What do you constantly uh, continue to put in your bag? What do you constantly continue to work on day by day by day by day? Because it is important, it is absolutely necessary that you work on certain things every day of your life. One is virtue. Now we talked about virtue last Sunday, so I won't go into that. We define virtue for you. And we explain to you what virtue was and how that virtue goes to the question of moral living, how that virtue goes to the question of how you live your life, what kind of person you are. Are you a moral person? And that God is moral. And because God is moral, we are moral because we want to be holy as God is holy. And so as a result, Peter says, now I want you to add to your faith the right kind of morality, the right kind of living. You don't live like your next door neighbor. You don't live like your co-worker. You, there is a difference between you and them. You live a different life. And the reason you live a different life is because you have a new life in Christ Jesus. And so now he says, add to your faith virtue. Add to your faith. Add to your faith. Now we just read about all the things that Peter congratulated them about. And one was their faith. One was their belief in Jesus Christ. One was their belief in the cross. One was their belief uh, in the Holy Spirit. They knew about how they are supposed 
uh, what they were supposed to believe. They knew that. They understood that. And Peter congratulated them. You have a strong faith in God. You have a strong faith in Christ Jesus. But there were some things you need. Number one, you need virtue. Number two, you need knowledge. You need knowledge. Now you're going to have to get virtue in your bag, which is morality, which is seeking to be holy as God is holy, which is to live a holy and moral life. That's, that's, that's important. Get that in your bag. He said, but now the second thing you need in your bag is knowledge. You see, there was, and I don't want to go into this because it would take too long. Uh, that is to dichotomize between knowledge and wisdom. You see, a person can have knowledge, but not wisdom. Well, I'm just going to say a couple of words about it. I said I wasn't going to get into it. Uh, but there is a decisive difference between wisdom and knowledge. You see, a person can be knowledgeable, but does not have any wisdom. You can have knowledge and not wisdom. But you can't have wisdom without knowledge. Oh, I said something there. That, that, but I don't want to go into it. Uh, I'm just dichotomizing between the two terms, uh, wisdom and uh, knowledge. Knowledge is the act of knowing. Of course, it's deeper than that. Knowledge is deeper than that. Uh, uh, epinosis is the word that we're going to be dealing with here in a few minutes uh, to show how deep the word now, all the term knowledge is, but uh, there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. One can have knowledge without wisdom, but one cannot have wisdom without knowledge. And that is, that, that's important. Uh, that, that's very important. Uh, one cannot have wisdom without knowledge, but one can have knowledge without wisdom. And anyone who has knowledge but not wisdom is a dangerous person. Is a dangerous person. You see, any one of us who have reached the age of accountability, uh, we, we, we know, uh, many of us in the building, we know how to use, uh, we know about guns and we, we know what a gun uh, will do. And, uh, but the problem is not the fact that you know uh, how to use a gun. That's not the question. Do you know how to use a gun? The question is, do you know when? Now, what I have just done, I just distinguished between wisdom and knowledge. You see, you may know, and we may have ladies in the building who may know how to use a gun, but the real question is, are you sure you know when? You see, the when is the wisdom, you see? And, and of course, uh, that's what Solomon meant when he said, uh, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But in all that getting, get understanding. Now, you, you might know how to use a gun, but do you understand when to use the gun? You see, and, and that's a dichotomy uh, between wisdom uh, and uh, and knowledge. Now, when we use the word knowledge, let me do this quickly. When we use the word knowledge, particularly in the New Testament, we're dealing with a Greek word, genosko. When we, when, we, when we see the word know in the Old Testament, we're dealing uh, with the Hebrew word yada, 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 y-a-d-a, yada, yada, uh, uh, yada. Uh, in some instances, it's spelled y-a-y. Uh, D-A, yada. Uh, and it means to know. Uh, and of course, uh, rather than delve into this, it, it is, uh, it is, I think it's, it's, it's expedient just to say that the word know in both Old and New Testament has different meanings depending upon where you find it in the text. Uh, because the word know could mean acquaintance. You know, I, uh, for an example, uh, in the eighth chapter uh, of the book of Genesis, when uh, God destroyed the world uh, by water, uh, uh, the Bible is clear that Noah sent out a raven 
and Noah sent out a dove and the dove came back to Noah and when the dove came back to Noah after uh, a couple of times uh, he had an olive leaf in his mouth uh, and the Bible says that Noah knew that the water had abated he didn't see the water uh, he was not out there when the water was falling but when that dove brought that leaf back to Noah in his uh, beak Noah knew that the water had abated. Now what does that mean? That simply means that uh, Noah uh, applied wisdom. Uh, Noah uh, understood that for that dove to have that leaf in his bib uh, or in his beak simply meant that the water had gone down. So we can know some things are uh, based on wisdom, based on our thinking, based upon rationalization. We can know certain things. And when you get into that area, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about uh, uh, wisdom. Now, the word know in the Old Testament, the word yara, it not only means to know uh, by experience, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, to know uh, in terms of uh, uh, friendship or relationship. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean to know because of certain uh, methods you have used to arrive at certain, uh, certain kinds of knowledge. But that word K-N-O-W in the Old Testament, yada, uh, uh, could in many instances mean relationship. Uh, it, it, it could mean, uh, in many instances, uh, union, uh, because in the fourth chapter of the book of uh, uh, Genesis and verse number one, the Bible says, uh, then Adam knew, K-N-E-W, then Adam knew his wife, and she brought forth a son, and she called his name Cain. So there you're talking about a relationship. There you're talking about a union. When the scripture says Adam knew his wife, uh, the word know or the word knew in that context indicated a union. It doesn't mean that he knew her name was Eve because after he knew her, uh, the Bible says that she brought forth a son. Same word, uh, but in a different, in, in a different uh, context. So we have to wonder, we have to understand that. Uh, in, in, the case of, uh, in the case of Jesus Christ, um, uh, Mary was a, was a virgin, and, uh, and the Bible makes clear that Joseph uh, married uh, Mary, but he knew her not until after the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Now you got the word new again, and that's the word union. So we, we have to understand contextually uh, how, uh, uh, how this, uh, this word uh, knowledge is uh, used. Now, Peter says, I want you to add uh, to your faith knowledge. Uh, now, that's, that's another word. Now, of course, uh, when, 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 um, when, when Paul writes to the church at Philippi, he says that I might know, that I might know him. Uh, that's genosco, uh, which simply means relationship. So the word know uh, could mean uh, and does mean in so many instances a relationship. Uh, so it just depends upon whether you're looking at genosco or whether you're looking at epinosis. Uh, now the word here uh, in, in, in the Peter text, first and second Peter, uh, the word is epinosis. Uh, e P I G N O S I S, epinosis. You can check it. Um, uh, we're talking here about real knowledge. Not only real knowledge, but we're talking about relationship. Everybody say relationship. relationship. That's what we're talking about. So now, what is Peter saying here? Peter was saying, uh, and beside all this, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. 
Now, uh, the word knowledge there is epinosis. Epinosis has the connotation or it denotes uh, relationship. In other words, what Peter was saying, you have all these other good things that you need. Uh, your faith is, is intact. You, uh, you, you are participating in the full knowledge of God. Uh, you have a strong faith. You have all of that, but you need knowledge. Now, the word knowledge here is not talking about uh, uh, mental knowledge. It is not talking about uh, brain knowledge necessarily. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about reading a book and then reciting something. That's not what it's talking about here. Add to your faith knowledge, epinosis. Now, what does that mean? That means a relationship. Relationship. Uh, uh, let me say this again. I, Peter was saying you have all these other things. Uh, you've been blessed by God. You are a participant in, uh, uh, in the full knowledge of God. You, you have the, uh, the power of your faith. You have all that good stuff. Uh, you come to church. You, watch, you have all that good. You treat people right. But you have virtue, that is, you're a moral man, you're a moral woman. You, you have all that good stuff, but you need to still add some things. And what you need to add is knowledge. And what do we mean by knowledge? The, the word epinosis simply indicates relationship. It means that uh, having all these other things, we, we come to church, we sit here, we sing, we give, we pray, and we fellowship one with another, but it is important. And you need to do all of your diligence to add knowledge, epinosis. You need to add uh, the behavior of a relationship with God. Peter says, now you have all these things. We can enumerate all these things. You've been baptized. You, you, you're a good woman of God. You're a good man of God. You, you, you're, you're, you're a wonderful person. But what about your relationship? Now, we're not talking about a relationship with each other. We're talking about a relationship with God. And what about your relationship? Do you have a good relationship with God? In other words, are you in relation with God? Now you've done all of the visible stuff and God has done his part through his grace. You did your part through your faith, God did his part through grace. And so you're okay, you're okay. You were in a safe position. There was no question about whether or not uh, being a member of the Church of Christ and having been baptized in water for remission of sins, that, that justifies you. That, that, that means that your justification is assured. You are in the process now of sanctification. But as you go from day to day, there are certain things you need to add, one of which is virtue and the other is knowledge which means a relationship. Now, do you have a relationship with God? You need to get that in your bag. Do you have a relationship with God? When did the relationship begin? Uh, the, the relationship uh, began when you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. That relationship began. John 14, 23. If a man will love me and keep my word, my father will come in. My Father will come in unto him, and we will make our abode with him. That's relationship. You see, you have a relationship with the Father. And, 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 and why this is so crucial is because uh, uh, it's a wonderful relationship, and it is a wonderful thing to be in a relationship with God, to have a relationship with God. For God to be a part of your life every day, a relationship. In other words, I'm comfortable with God because I have a relationship with God. I am comfortable with God because I have a relationship with him. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. I have a relationship with God. Now, there are folk who are saved uh, as we are in the building, but the thing is, the question is, do you have a relationship with God? Do you talk to him? Do you believe in him? 
Do you have communication with him? Do you have a relationship with him? Because you see, that's going to be important. See, that relationship is going to be very, very important. Now, when you turn to the seventh chapter of the book of Matthew, I want to show you something. The seventh chapter of the book of Matthew, and, well, we can begin anywhere. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, I guess I'm at verse 21, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will come to me in that day, saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that name? In that name have we not... Uh, cast out devils in the name have we not done many wonderful works then will I profess unto thee unto them depart from me I never knew see we're back to this word knowledge we're, we're back to, we're back to this word uh, 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 epinosis which now that is a see what Jesus is saying now uh, I never knew you what he is saying is, I never had a relationship with you. See, that's what he's saying. Well, well, what's going to keep these folk out of heaven? Not having a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see? So it's important, therefore, that those of us who are children of God, those of us who are Christian, we must understand that Jesus wants a relationship. Are with us now in Matthew 25 and verse number 12 can you get that up there Matthew 25 and verse number 12 he almost says the same thing he almost says the exact same thing Matthew 24 and verse uh, 25 and verse uh, uh, number number 12 oh, but he answered and said and now we're back over here okay uh, let me just see here. Uh, now you all gonna have to make up your mind here you're going to have to make up your mind. Uh, all right, we're over here now. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now, in, in, in Matthew chapter number 7, uh, and verse number 23, what Jesus is saying there is, I have no approving relationship with you. Uh, uh, depart from me. You see, he says, I know you're not, which simply means I don't have a relationship with you. So what's going to be, Im watch this now, what's going to be important when we stand before Jesus in the last day, we are going to be responsible for having, we, we will be responsible, uh, called into account for having or not having a relationship with Jesus. So relationship is important. Relationship is necessary. And when we talk about relationship, we're talking about fellowship. Uh, well, we're talking about being able to get along with. We're talking about being comfortable with. We're talking about being able to talk to. Being able to communicate with. Being able to be convinced that Jesus is who he say he is and I am comfortable with him because I believe he is who he said he was and my faith attests to the fact that he does in fact exist, that he did in fact exist, that he did in fact die on the old rugged cross and he is my savior. I believe in him to the point that I talk to him every day. I pray to him every day because I have a relationship with him. And not only do I talk with him and pray to him, but I trust him. I trust him to do exactly what he says when he said what he said. I have a relationship. Now there are folk who have all this other good stuff uh, I'm a good man, I'm a good woman, I'm a good mother, I'm a good father, I'm a good, whatever the case is. And, and nobody question that. Nobody question your veracity uh, 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 regarding those things. But, but the question is, do you have a relationship with Jesus? 
and that is, do you, uh, do you grow, or have you grown since you've been a child of God in your relationship with Jesus? Now, what does that mean? That, that just simply means that I am more convinced today than I was last year that Jesus is real and that he does exist and my God is not dead because I talked to him this morning. You see, we're talking about a relationship. Are you comfortable with him? Are you comfortable with Jesus? How do you talk to him? Do you talk to him as if he is some potentate? And, and that is when you pray, to, and I'm not telling you how to pray, or how to, words to quote, I'm not doing that. Uh, I mean, how do you approach Jesus? Do you approach him as a friend? Do you approach him as someone that you are in relationship with? How do you approach him? Do you a, approach him, and, and you know, you hear, you hear us as brothers pray, and then we say, Oh Lord, I God unto the omnipotent, omnipresent, all wise, infinite God. Thou art omnipotent, thou art omniscient, thou art all, you know. Well, I guess that's okay. But David says, The Lord is my shepherd. You know, you really don't have to go through all of that. You know, and you really, you really don't have to know all of that if you are in a relationship. I mean, if you're in a relationship with your wife, how do you approach your wife? Um, do you walk up to her and say, uh, Mrs. Washington, I'm Mr. Washington, and I want to say to you today that I want breakfast in the morning, and what I would like, do you, do, do you? I mean, if you have a relationship, you don't have to go through all of that. You know, if you have a relationship with your wife and with, or with your husband, whatever the case is, you know, you don't have to remind your wife or remind your husband or call them by them. And, but, you know, back in the day, uh, grandmama did, that's, they called uh, their husband daddy. Not that they was afraid of him, but that was just a, a word of endearment. They said, you know, daddy. And, 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 and grandpa called, you know, his wife, you know, mama. I mean, and, and those are words of, of endearment. We don't do that now, but we did, you know, they did uh, back, in, back in the day. What I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is that you, you should establish a relationship with Jesus. You, you, you should establish a level of comfort with him because that's what he wants. You know, when Paul says that I might know him. See, he was not talking about intellectuality. He was talking about a relationship. He wanted to know, he wanted to know Jesus as his savior. He wanted to know how it was possible that Jesus would go, could go through what he went through and yet not fight back. Paul says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. I want to know him in the sense that he was able to be cursed at, spit on, and yet, not fought, yet he did not fight back. I want to have a relationship with him. And the reason I want to have a relationship with him is I want to be more like him. I want to be more like him. Well, how was he? When he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was, when he was spat upon, he didn't spit back. When, when, they crowned, when they put a crown of thorns on his head, 
He did not call 12 legions of angels and wipe them all out, but he had the power to do it. Paul says, I want to know. I, I want to know him. And the reason I want to know him is he has something that I need. Because in the words, Paul is saying that what the Lord has, I need that. And the only way that I'm going to be able to get that, I am going to have to establish a relationship with him. And I establish this relationship with him through faith. That is believing that he is the son of the living God. Now the question becomes, uh, 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 are there any persons in the building this morning who have not established a relationship with Jesus Christ? When does the relationship begin? The relationship begins in Romans chapter 6. Roman chapter 6 and verse number 1. Paul writes to the church at Rome. And here's what he says. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? In verse number 3, the Bible says, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And then Romans 4, I mean Romans 6 and 4, the Bible says, therefore we are buried with him. That's where the relationship begins. The relationship begins with your having faith that Jesus is who we say he is. And when we are baptized with him, that's where the relationship begins with him that's the relationship therefore we are baptized we are buried with him by baptism and the death that like as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in the newness of life when does that relationship begin that relationship begins when we obey the gospel of jesus christ and what i need you to do i need you to just check yourself ask yourself do we have, do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Am I comfortable with him? Am I comfortable with Jesus? I mean, is he my elder brother? Is he my doctor when I don't feel well or when I'm in the hospital? Is he really that doctor that never lost a patient? Is he really that lawyer that never lost a case? I mean, uh, I want to have a relationship with him. And I want to feel that relationship as I move from day to day. As I go in and out. I want to feel that relationship. In other words, I, I want to trust him. I want to trust him. I, I want to believe in him so strongly that I know whatever he says is going to happen. Because of my relationship. I trust him. See, when you have a relationship with someone, you have to trust them. And if you don't trust them, you don't have a relationship. I don't know what you have, but you don't have a relationship. So it is important, therefore, that those of you who may be in the building this morning who have not said yes to Jesus, that I'm telling you and I'm, I'm, I'm pleading to you as Peter uh, preached to those folk uh, that were scattered uh, over Asia Minor who had obeyed the gospel on the day of Pentecost when he said to them, he says, now you need to put knowledge in your bag. Not, not, not secular knowledge, not, not two and two is four, and, and five dollars plus five dollars equal ten dollars. No, not, not that. This knowledge is a relationship with Jesus Christ. In other words, all of those of us who are Christians should be in a relationship with Jesus. And nothing comes between that relationship. 
The devil himself cannot break that relationship. And Peter is saying to the church, he's saying, now listen, you need to add this to your faith. You have all that other stuff. If I were to ask you, what did you do to become a child of God? You would say, oh, Doc, here's what I did. And you can just, you know, tell me. Uh, I believe the gospel. I repented of my sins. I confessed and I was baptized and, and I'm a member of the Church of Christ. Well, you, and you are correct. But do you have a relationship with Jesus, do you trust him? Do you turn your cares over to him knowing that he cares for you? Yes, I do. And I do it because I have a relationship with Jesus. And, and this relationship is strong because he knows what I need better than I know myself. And I trust him in this relationship because I know that he is going to do exactly what he said he's going to do. When he says, let not your hearts be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me, in my father's house of many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. Do you trust that? Do you trust that? I trust that. Why do you trust him? Because I'm in a relationship with him. And I know he's true to me. And I'm seeking every day to be as true to him. It's a mindset. Not only is it a mindset, but it is a position in the sanctification process that all of us should hunger after, and that is have a relationship with Jesus. So now, you need that in your bag. Now, you got all this other good stuff in 1 Peter chapter number 1. You, you, you got all that good stuff. That's, that's no problem. You, you, you have all of that. You have all of that. Now, you come to church, you give as you prosper, you... Uh, you come to Sunday school, you come, you, you, uh, you come to Bible study, you, you got all of that. And uh, you, you're living the best life that you, that you can, that the Lord will bless you to live. You, you got all of that. Now, do you have a relationship with Jesus? In other words, are you in relationship with Jesus? You see, when you are in relationship with someone, there are certain things expected of you. And not only is there certain things expected of you, but there are certain things expected from both parties in the, in, in the relationship. And what I'm trying to do, I, I'm trying to get you mentally to that point. I, I, I'm trying, to, I, I'm trying to, to show you the importance of having that mindset, a relationship with Jesus. In other words, he's not someone who's sitting up there on the throne with, with a long sword in his hand. And he's waiting, I mean, he's just waiting for me to stumble, and he's going he's gonna to whip me with that sword. Or he's going to send me bad luck. And so, uh, I'm afraid of him. Well, that's not a relationship. You see, a relationship, both parties are comfortable with each other. And that relationship is cemented and uh, concretized by love. God loves me, and I love my father because we have a relationship with each other. He has promised me certain things. He has promised that he will be with me always to the end of the world. He has promised me eternal life. And he has told me that I need not fear. He has told me that if I would walk, in the path of righteousness that he walks with me, he told me that when I stumble and fall, all I have to do 
is get up and come back to him. And that's what I do. And the reason that's what I do is because of our relationship. That's a mindset. And so Peter says to the church, he says, now, you need to put that in your bag. If that's not in your bag, you need to put that in your bag. Because you're going to really need that one. Because uh, he goes on to say in chapter number four, he says, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You see? It's a relationship. Now, how is your relationship with Jesus? Now, I'm not asking you, do you believe in here, believe, repent, confess. I'm not asking you, do you come to church. I'm not, I'm not, I, what I'm asking you is, do you have a relationship with Jesus? That's the question. Now, you, see, you, you may not like uh, your preacher. You may say, I don't like him. Oh, oh, okay. That's important. You should like me, but if you don't, then <laughs> what, what can I say? What can I say? Uh, but it is important to love the Lord because of what he did for us and for you on the hilltops of Calvary. Now, if you do not have that relationship, it's a mindset. If you do not have that relationship, I am entreating you that you need to strengthen that relationship. And, and, and how do you do it? You seek every day to be the best person you can possibly be. You seek every day to be stronger and to love Jesus more. When you really love, that will determine your conduct. When you really love. Love determines your conduct. Love determines how you carry yourself. Love determines that. And if you have this relationship with Jesus, you will find it will make you a better person. And the reason it will make you a better person is because you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And as a result, the devil has no way to get into your life because you're already in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, if you do not have that relationship and you are a member of the body of Christ, you can strengthen your relationship. Now, you receive that relationship when you became a member of the Church of Christ, when you became a child of God. That's when you received that relationship. That's when you went into that relationship. Now, Peter was saying, you need to strengthen that. You need to strengthen that. And how do you strengthen that? You strengthen that by seeking to know Jesus a little bit better every day. How do you strengthen that? You strengthen that by visualizing what he did when he hung, bled, and died for my sins and yours. It's a thought thing as well. Now, if you have not strengthened your relationship with Jesus, and if this principle is not in your bag, then you need to get it in there. And then, God forbid, when it comes your time to press a dying pillow, the only thing that's going to sustain you on your deathbed is your relationship with Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. The only thing that will sustain you when you press a dying pillow is Jesus Christ. I've been in these rooms. I've been in intensive care with members of our church and, and throughout this brotherhood. And I've seen people in comas. And I've seen people trying to come out of a coma. I, I, and I've seen beloved Christians 
who were frightened to death because they was about to embark on a journey that they had not been on before. And it's a lonely journey if you don't have a relationship with Jesus. But when you have a relationship with Jesus, you know figuratively, metaphorically, that he's in the hospital room. Oh, he's here, he's here. I'm suffering, but he's here. He's here. And what is he here for? He's come to get me. And he's going to take me back with him. And I believe that with all of my heart because of my relationship that I've had with him down through the years. I believe that because I have called on him many times in my life. I, I was in, I, 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 I've been in difficulty. I needed, I need heavenly help. And the only way I could get it was to call on Jesus. And I called him by his name and he answered my prayer. So when you come to the end of life's journey, just know that he'll come for you. And he'll be with you through all of the valleys and the shadows of death. And if you're here and you want to say yes to him, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're not a child of God, you have not said yes to Jesus, then you need to do it right now. How do you do it, Brother Preacher? How do I begin this relationship? I, I've not... I've not been baptized. I'm not, I'm not a Christian. I don't even go to church. Uh, I don't even know whether I like church or not. Well, I'm not asking you to like church. I'm, I'm asking you to like Jesus. Love Jesus. You can't love Jesus without loving the church. And you can't be in the church without being in Jesus. You see what I'm saying? And so I'm saying to you now, if you're a member of the church and you need, you need prayer, we're going to pray for you in just a moment. And if you're not a Christian, you've not been baptized for remission of your sins. Because the only way you can get in Jesus is through baptism. Only way. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And if you're in the building, if you're in the room, and you want to start your relationship with Jesus, that's the greatest relationship in the world. Because, you see, he'll be in that relationship when all others leave. Yeah, yeah, that's a whole nother sermon right there. But, but you see, you have a relationship with other folk, but other folk will walk off and leave you. They'll walk off and leave you. And, and they'll walk off and leave you, as Mama say, for little or nothing. They'll walk off and leave you. But Jesus says, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. We're going to ask everybody to please stand. And, and while you are standing, we're going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ.